At the end of Acts chapter 23, Paul, as a prisoner of Rome, is moved from Jerusalem to Caesarea. And the commander of the Roman garrison in Jerusalem, Claudius Lysias, has written a letter, and that letter accompanies Paul on this journey. The statements made when they came to Caesarea that they delivered the letter to the governor and they also presented Paul to him. When the governor had read the letter, he asked what province he was from, and when he understood that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers also come. He commanded Paul to be kept in the Herod's Praetorium. After five days, the high priest came with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullus. And these gave evidence to the governor against Paul. Listen to the way Tertullus describes Paul. We have found this man a plague, verse 5 of chapter 24, a creator of dissension among all the Jews throughout the world, a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to profane the temple, and we seized him and wanted to judge him according to our law. But the commander Lysias came by and with great violence took him out of our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him, you yourself may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. In his defense, Paul later says this, They neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting the crowd, either in the synagogues or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. He makes a statement in verse 16 that he has always strived to live um, and have a good conscience without offense toward God always. And he actually makes the observation that those that actually had the, the problem with him were not the ones that actually came to the court of Felix to give their assessment of the problem. These individuals from Asia, the Jews from Asia, found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob nor with tumult, and they ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. Or let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement which I cried out concerning the resurrection of the dead, I mean judged by you this day. Felix listened to these things, didn't make a judgment about, about what uh, the ruling should be. Later on in verse 24, he comes back and listens to Paul again. But this time Paul is talking about the faith in Christ. Verse 25, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix said, leave for now. When I have a convenient time, I'll call for you. You find later on the very last verses of Acts chapter 24 that there were numerous occasions in which Felix would actually bring Paul back and listen to him, have discussions with him. But this idea of having a convenient time, when it's convenient for me, I'll listen. When it's convenient for me, then I'll analyze what you say. Living with convenience. Can you imagine a setting of the the alarm goes out and and first responders are notified and maybe it's uh, the need of a paramedic, maybe your house is on fire, maybe something else is happening, there's a, a burglar inside the residence at that moment in time, and nobody responds for an hour and a half. And when you ask, why did you take so long to get here? They said, it just wasn't convenient. We had something going on at the, at, the, uh, at the precinct, or we had things going on at the station, and we had just sat down to eat this great meal. It was not convenient for us to leave. Would you buy that explanation? Would that excuse be okay? When somebody says, I really don't want to think about God right now, I don't want to look at the details of the story of Jesus. I don't want to consider what is going to happen after my time on this earth runs out. I'm just not, it's just not a convenient time for me to focus on those kind of things. When is it convenient? How much longer are you going to be here on this earth? Do you know the final date on the calendar of when you take your last breath? So when is a convenient time? It's interesting that this phrase is used by this individual, and yet later on, he sent for Paul more often and conversed with him. Verse 26, he kept him in prison for two years. But there's a motive behind why he's doing that. He hoped that money would be given him by Paul. Man, if Paul bribes me enough, maybe I can release him. But in the meantime, I'm going to listen. Am I going to change my life? Yeah, not really. 
um, because the more I'm in his presence, the more I bring him before me, maybe that will spur him on to actually find a way to get some money together that will appease me and I'll find a way to release him sooner. But as it stands, we'll keep him in prison for two years. A convenient time. It's never an excuse that's worthwhile. Students can't use it uh, with their teachers about not having their homework, not studying for exams. Employees can't use it with their employer about not being present for work, uh, missing on various occasions just because it wasn't convenient for them to come into work. We don't accept that anywhere in society. Why would anyone accept it as far as Christianity is concerned? Why would anybody accept it when the condition of the soul and eternity hangs in the balance? And we want, do not want to be individuals like this governor. If we don't have, number one, ulterior motives behind anything that we do in the name of religion. But there's got to be a recognition that this is a subject matter that is vital. And we need to determine the way it applies to our life and whether or not we're going to be obedient or knowingly disobedient with all the consequences that that brings down on our head. May none of us wait for a convenient season to be obedient to God or to study His Word. Stay safe. We'll talk again soon.